<clears throat> Good morning. And welcome to episode four of COVID Catechism. My name is Father Ryan Humphreys, and today we're talking about exorcisms and spiritual warfare. Remember this topic, this, this series is not meant to be just the basics of Christianity or the basics of Catholicism. We really want to kind of reach out and give those of us who are looking for a little bit more as we're kind of stuck here in quarantine, you know, a little bit more to think on. This is an opportunity for us to think on that. The reason I chose this topic really does boil down to the fact that my concern, personally speaking, that the biggest thing that we have lost touch with in the Catholic Church in the last, say, 75 to 100 years is the supernaturality of what we're about. You know, when we have crises in the church, whatever they may be, all too many of us immediately go to what we might call a horizontal solution. And so we see bad bishops, bad priests, and the first thing we think about is psychology and legal policy and, uh, and how we can get our lawyerliness on, and we need to think about programs and, and policies and, and possibly resources. We don't quickly enough think to what we might call the vertical dimension, the supernaturality of our faith. And the problem is all too often we tend to think of the world and, and the world around us as really just a material world. We tend to think about it as entirely a function of what individuals are interacting with individuals and we don't pay adequate attention to the real role that the grace of God, spiritual realities, angels, demons, and, and just the simple spiritual reality of the world in which we live, the fact that we are not merely in a material world. We are in a world where there is a spiritual dimension very, very active. And when we lose touch with that, we find ourselves in an entirely horizontal way of thinking, and then we begin to think about the church as nothing more than a place where social justice happens, or a community setting, or a place where we do this or we do that, as opposed to people who are genuinely actors for the Lord. Remember that, that St. Teresa of Avila talked about us having no, that Lord has no hands on earth but ours, no feet on earth but ours. And if we are not really at the depth of ourselves saying, Lord, I am at your service, whatever you want from me, I will do. If that's not our disposition, then we are just playing the same game everyone else is playing. And one of my favorite quotations comes from a comedian, Lily Tomlin, back in the 80s, where she said, the problem with the rat race is that whether you win or lose, you're still a rat. And when we lose touch with the supernaturality of our faith, when we lose touch with the fact that what we are doing here is supernatural, that we're not just, I'm not just a priest standing here at the altar lifting up some bread that then has a symbolic effect that's going to, when I reach a supernatural moment after my death, have some effect. We're talking about the Holy Eucharist being something that transforms the world. Now, it's easy for us to look at a few highlighted moments in history and say, well, what about when the Holy Eucharist was blasphemed? What about at black masses? Clearly, it's just a symbol because if God really cared, then God would make this supernatural reality protected in some way. But we have to remember what we're celebrating right now as I say these words is the sacred Paschal Triduum when Jesus Christ himself came among us, allowed himself to be mocked, insulted, spit upon, put uh, in, a, you know, in, in a crown of thorns and in a, a, a purple robe, insulted, treated like dirt, ultimately killed, precisely in order to show that he is far beyond anything this world can do. None of those things can have any meaningful effect. No, no physical reality in this world can actually harm the soul of us. But the spiritual realities of this world can do all sorts of stuff. And if we pretend that they're not happening, it's no different than, you know, say, say uh, you know, a, a, a one of those, those men, those southern men who says, I don't need to go to the hospital. I know my arm fell off, but I mean, you know, it, it'll be fine. It, I'm sure it'll grow back or something. I mean, you know, I don't want to go to the doctor. I'm just going to pretend everything's fine. That's a kind of delusion that leads to where we find ourselves in the Catholic Church today. 
where we do not have any confidence in our bishops. We do not have any confidence in our priests. We don't have confidence in one another. We don't have confidence in the scripture. We don't have confidence in the teaching of the church. And so we have this, you know, this completely chaotic structure in which we're living because we have lost touch with the fact that what we're doing here is not natural. We're not Catholic because that bishop's a good bishop or that priest is a good priest. We're not Catholic because that person made a compelling argument. We're not Catholic because the church is pretty or the music is good. We're Catholic because that is truly God. Jesus, present in the most holy sacrament, is God among us, fulfilling his promise to remain with us always, even into the end of the age. And that reality transforms everything we do here. Because you know what? It's a whole lot more fun to go down to the Baptist. It's a whole lot more entertaining to go to the family church. It's a whole lot more feeling like I'm home and welcome and accepted at the Methodist church. It's a whole lot better to, you know, in terms of my connections with people and my getting a good job, at least where I live, if I'm Pentecostal. It's a whole lot better for me if I want to, you know, get into politics to be Mormon. It's a whole lot better to blah, 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 blah. Because there are material realities at play. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters when it comes to religion is the supernatural reality. And so, y'all, we can be in a church that is a hot dumpster fire of a mess, and we kind of are. But at the end of the day, the supernatural question is the only question that matters. And the reason I talk so much about exorcisms is because several years ago I attended one. I was present, not, not of my own will. I just kind of ended up being there through a series of coincidences. And I was at a, an event. I was at a, a, a large event. And there was the priest who was kind of the official exorcist priest of our diocese at the time. And he was there, and he had kind of stumbled into this situation where he was effectively trying to quash down what we might uh, refer to as a dramatic incident where uh, there was a demonic uh, expression taking place. And this little young girl, she probably might must have been, gosh, 14, 15 years old. Uh, this was not her first encounter with this priest. She had had some issues with exorcism and demonic possession before, and there was an ongoing kind of connection with trying to deal with it. And so I stumbled into this situation where this little young girl is there, and her several of her friends, and I think her, her perhaps her youth minister, maybe her aunt was there, and, and they were all freaking out. They had seen some of these things before, but they were all freaking out. And there were a couple of security guards there trying to figure out because this girl was screaming and pushing and throwing and raging. And so we had these two big old big security guards. You know, I'm a big old giant fat guy. These guys made me look like a, a string bean. And this little girl basically just reaches back and pushes one of these, you know, 330 pound guys halfway across a room, knocks him into the wall. And she pushes the other guy and his feet left the ground for a moment. I mean, and this girl couldn't have weighed 90 pounds soaking wet. And when we finally were able to kind of get her under some sense of control, her friends kind of, you know, holding her, they were all freaking out. We started saying the prayers, and as soon as we started saying the creed, which doesn't to me strike as one of the great exorcism prayers of our era, and the Hail Mary, this girl began to blaspheme. She began to speak in a deeper voice. She began to scream and to squeal. She began to say horrible things about Jesus and the Blessed Virgin Mary that scared the bejesus out of me. And I realized then, and I'd realized it before, but I really, it hit home then that what we're doing here is not a natural thing. What we're doing here is not about whether or not this is the purtiest altar we can find. It's not about whether I can sing. It's not about whether that bishop is worth his salt. It's not about this or that or the other circumstance in which the church has responded in a natural level to some crisis or some need. We're in the midst of something infinitely deeper and more profound. And if we continue to pretend that that's not the case, we will find our church, at least our church in our area, dying. 
But if we catch hold of the reality that it, what we are doing here is supernatural, it changes our whole perspective on everything. It causes us to be able to forgive a lot more quickly. It makes it a lot easier for me to, to, be, to live through and to endure a moment like this, this quarantine, where we ask serious questions about the future of our nation, the future of our church, the future of our religious faith, generally speaking. This moment becomes a lot easier to live when we realize there are supernatural things going on. And now it's possible to explain some of this in terms of those. And at the very end, I'll give you a few of my thoughts on that. But I really want us just to keep in our minds how important it is to think about the world in which we live, not merely as a natural reality, but as a very seriously supernatural reality. You know, what we're doing here is not just living our lives. We're in the midst of a great spiritual war. And if we don't recognize that, we can act like a fool who decides I'm just going to stroll through a gunfight and the bullets are soaring and I'm going, it's fine. That's just a delusion. That's just what those religious people think. But those bullets will hit you just as hard as any other bullets. And I know there's some folks in our world today, as we look around and we see how high our depression rate is, as we look at how high our suicide rate is, we look at how many people in the United States take drugs of various sorts just to make it through the day. And I'm not even talking about illegal drugs. I mean, we take more pills in this nation for stomach issues and IBS and mood conduction and all sorts of other things. We take more pills by an, a, a ratio of like eight or nine pills to one. The U.S. consumes more pills and pretty much the rest of the world combined. And if we want to pretend that that's just some mystical, you know, we've, oh, we, 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 our food is not good, or we're not eating right, goodness gracious, there's more to the story than just the natural explanations that we convince ourselves are okay. So I want to get into a little bit about what we understand as a Catholic Church about exorcism and spiritual warfare. Now, most of us have witnessed exorcism. We probably have not thought about them. We probably have not paid that much attention to them. But if you've ever been to a baptism, or if you've been to the Saturday, Holy Saturday Paschal Vigil, you've witnessed exorcisms, because baptisms include not one, but three separate exorcisms. Now, we don't generally baptize the cute little baby and then see green pea soup pouring out of their mouths, a la the exorcist from the 70s. That doesn't generally happen, but that is a legitimate exorcism. If you've ever seen holy water blessed using the traditional formulary with the exorcism of salt and the blessing of salt and the exorcism of water and the blessing of water, then you have witnessed an exorcism. That's an exorcism of a thing and not a person, but you've seen it. If certain sacramentals, like the blessing of a St. Benedict medal, is the same way. A St. Benedict medal includes a couple of exorcisms as part of the formal blessing of the sacramental. And so some of us, in fact most of us, have seen an exorcism at some level. You know, we, we've seen what, what is formally speaking a, a priest or a, be, a, a deacon, priest, or bishop casting out the devil from someone or something. A clergyman casting out the devil from someone or something is an exorcism. And so most of us have seen that. We've encountered that in some way, shape, or form. That is not, of course, what we tend to think of when we think of exorcism because our minds tend to go to the movies. Now, what I love about this is that the movies are both far, far more dramatic than actual exorcisms, and they are far less dramatic. Because in the movies, we tend to see a, a moment where someone is writhing around, they've had physical changes to their face, maybe they're floating off the bed, this is somebody who has typically been caught completely off guard, there have been no warning signs, suddenly they're ex you know, exploding in this manifestation and they're shooting you know, light from their hands and they call in the priest. They've already tried calling in the Ghostbusters. They've already tried calling in, you know, the, the surgeon. They've already done the electric shock therapy. They call in the priest. This person is doing all this kind of stuff. The priest comes in and he pulls out his cross, you know, just his boring old cross, not his crucifix. And he walks in and he starts doing this kind of, you know, Lone Ranger kind of, of, of just nonsensical stuff. This kind of action hero stuff. 
and he begins to scream and to shout these memorized prayers in Latin, and he says eight or nine prayers, and depending on the movie, either the demon comes up and attacks the priest, or the demon runs in terror from the priest, and that's it. So we've had 60 seconds of exorcism, and poof, something big has happened. Now, in reality, when we're talking about the exorcism of a person, we are already been in contact with this person over the course of a bit of time. Because when someone thinks that they are possessed in some way, shape, or form, the first thing they do is they get in touch with a priest who, in their, in usually their local pastor, and they say, Father, I don't know what's going on, but this is what I think is happening. Now, that priest has a couple of obligations. First, his job is to say, is this person crazy? I mean, is this a person? I've had several come to, come to my house and say, look, I believe I'm possessed. Can you give me $20 to go get it taken care of? And you go, that's probably not the most solid case for an exorcism. But when those, the folks will come to me and they say, look, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about these things. Uh, I'm, my job then is to say, are, is that person, is this a real thing? Or is this person probably having a psychological episode, whatever the case may be? Generally speaking, what I want to do is I want to, in my mind, think about what am I seeing? Am I seeing somebody who is coming here with some of the classic signs of possession? Now, Father, what are the classic signs of possession? Well, there are quite a few of them, but the ones that we really expect to see for somebody who is full-on possessed, and I want to talk about the levels of possession in a minute, but for someone who is full-on possessed, we expect to see someone who is missing time. Big number one thing, this is a person who in their ordinary life, their ordinary life has become unlivable. They are having moments where they have no idea what happened to the last hour. They cannot live their day-to-day -day life anymore because it's just too much chaos. Any mention of anything holy, especially our Lord and Our Lady, will cause that person to become enraged. They will be experiencing absolutely uncontrollable mood swings um, that take them from, from being perfectly normal to, I mean, homicidal rage. Generally speaking, you'll also see some more mystical sort of things. And this seems crazy, but people will be able to suddenly and unexplicably speak foreign languages. You know, somebody who, the little girl who, who I witnessed her exorcism began speaking German. She never didn't know the language, had no idea of it. I only knew an, a little bit to understand what she was saying, but she was speaking perfect, perfectly accented Southern German. And so that's another one of those things that we say, gosh, is that, is, is that a real deal? It does happen. We also witness a strong aversion to physical manifestations of faith, not wooden crosses. This is not Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but crucifixes, rosaries, blessed items of all sorts. And in fact, one of the first things that happens when a person goes to the real exorcism is that the exorcist will have several bottles of holy water. Some will be real holy water and some will be just be tap water. And one of the ways that he knows whether this person is the real deal is when he sprinkles that person with water as part of the ritual, he will know whether it's the real deal or the fake water and the person who is possessed will, will actually respond either you know, they won't know and he will. And so if there's a demon involved, the demon will know. If there's not, then the person, will, will, and the person is trying to fake it, whether they're aware they're faking it or whether they're unconsciously faking it, will not be able to respond, and so the exorcist will know. And so an aversion to holy water is another one of those big signs. And so when, I, when I've chatted with some folks in this situation, I've asked them some questions and given them a chance to you know, receive a blessing here, take this book, take this rosary, and just to get a sense of what's going on. Now let's backtrack for a second from that first step and say, what are the stages of demonic possession? Well, the first stage of demonic possession really does boil down to whether or not an object has become in some way cursed or haunted. Now, this seems silly where we're not talking about, uh, you know, the, the movies with the doll. We're not talking about Annabelle, um, but we're talking about objects which from time to time 
can be associated with evil. So an object that is used for a satanic ritual, for example, will develop a kind of curse associated with it. And we're not talking about King Tut's tomb. We're not talking about, you know, some kind of silly prophecy in a book somewhere. It's just that it has, it just kind of makes you feel wiggy and it gives you the wiggins. And this is generally the same sort of thing that happens with a haunted house. You know, so you, you, I, I've been to several, you know, haunted houses where I've seen all sorts of creepy stuff. Um, and, and, you know, the, the blessing of, of, generally speaking, making holy water with the traditional formula, exercising the salt, blessing the salt, exercising the water, blessing the water, blessing the house, generally takes care of business. Because objects, inanimate objects, homes, can be haunted. That's a thing. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about haunting all the way back in the Summa Theologica. He gives us the, the, the three different explanations of what a ghost might be. A ghost could be a demon. A ghost could be a holy soul from purgatory that for whatever reason is experiencing part of their purgation in a way that interacts with us, or it could simply be a phenomenon that we don't have an explanation for yet. For example, back way back when the northern lights were thought to be ghost riders in the sky by you know, Native American Indians, it, you know, and, and we still have certain phenomenon that we don't know how to explain, so we think about it as paranormal or supernatural, and it just turns out that, oh, EMF fields that are a result of having, you know, living next door to a power plant can give you the Wiggins, and so, you know, it's not a ghost, but it sure did feel like one. Uh, and so, so we have kind of a, a basic understanding of, of inanimate objects. That's not generally what we think of when we think of exorcism, but technically any blessing of an object or a place falls into that category of exorcisms, and it call, therefore it falls into that category of possession. Now, the two degrees that we talk about with a person are we talk about obsession, I should say three, obsession, oppression, and uh, uh, possession. So when we talk about someone having an interaction with a demonic entity of some sort, the very, very smallest category, the lightest category we talk about is obsession. This is when someone inexplicably becomes completely obsessed with something which they know is bad for them, but they can't seem to get away from it. This looks a lot like addiction. It looks a lot like somebody who has begun drinking or doing drugs or gambling or looking at pornography, and they find themselves just unable to think about anything else. It becomes a spiritual concern when it's not just in terms of what I'm doing, but it's when I just am constantly thinking all the time about things that I know are detrimental to me, things which are fundamentally evil, things which are contrary to faith. And it's not just that from time to time a temptation pops into my head, it's that I'm always thinking about it. You know, I wake up thinking about it, and it seems like I, I get no rest during the day. And when this happens to you, you can go to the priest. And the priest has certain prayers he can offer for that situation. Now, after obsession, we move to oppression. This is when we start to have the first of those warning signs, aversion to holy things and unwillingness to say the name of Jesus, you know, a, a sense of, of really being having a hard time praying, you know, feeling, feeling nauseated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing. And someone who experiences this is not having a happy life. Someone who experiences this sense of, of, I just don't want anything to do with anything religious or anything to do with anything good or moral, and the only time I feel like myself is when I'm around something which we would consider to be evil or demonic. Then we get to possession. So by the time we get to possession, where someone is missing time, having these rage blackouts, things like that, by the time we get there, we've gone through some stages. So it's not the exorcism of Emily Rose where she wakes up one night and she goes from sweet little girl to absolutely possessed overnight. That's not the way it works. And generally speaking, you have to kind of get involved in the occult or you have to get involved in something demonic to kind of make this happen. And so generally speaking, by the time someone comes to knock on my door and says, Father, I think I might be possessed, they've got a pretty good sense this has been going on for a while and it's been building up. Maybe they haven't dealt with it, maybe they have. Now, whatever the diagnosis, whether I believe this person is a full-on possessed or not, the first round of treatment is always the same. You've got to go to confession. 
You've got to get your spiritual life in order. You've got to start praying. You've got to start praying the rosary. You've got to start doing penance. You've got to start abstaining uh, f- you know, from meat on Fridays. You've got to start doing some fasting during the week. And, and this is basic step one. And even people who find themselves hating you know, the, this, this, these things, this is step one. This is what we have to do. And so if you are concerned in any way, shape, or form about your own spiritual health, that's step one. You've got to go to confession as soon as this quarantine ends. You've got to receive communion only when you're in a state of grace. You've got to be genuine and serious about praying every day. You've got to pray the rosary, and you've got to you know, really make a meaningful effort to do penance. Now, that may be really hard, and for somebody who's possessed, it may be at the edge of impossible, but that's step one. For people on the obsession side and the lower side, that's going to be a big part of the equation. Because as often as not, people knock on the door and say, I'm possessed. And you say, when was the last time you went to confession? And they say, my confirmation or First Holy Communion. And so big, big, big part of the equation is just making a regular confession, y'all. Once a month, once every three months at the latest, don't convince yourself that you can go to confession once a year or just, you know, on rare occasions, it won't work. It's simply not the real deal. Now, once we talk about real possession, once we get to that point, we do have to, and, one, and if, if someone comes to me and I say, they've got all the warning signs, and I tell them, look, the first step is to go do these prayers, go to confession regularly, then, we, and, they still, and they say, look, I'm st- it's still happening, then the next step is to move to the formal process, the formal process of exorcism, which involves talking to the bishop, getting the bishop's consent, getting the bishop's uh, instruction. The bishop will then assign an exorcist. That person will, have, will develop a relationship with that exorcist and probably go to them you know, 40, 50 times, it, it, you know, w- w- during which the, the exorcist will start with, a, with some simple prayers, some simple conversation. It's not psychological counseling. And that person will also be expected to go do some basic medical treatment. We need to know if they're epileptic. We need to know if it's schizophrenia. We need to know if they have you know, uh, chemical disorders in the brain that are imitating what could look like, um, what could look like uh, a possession. And so when, uh, within the, the church, the way it works is that we, we want to be super aware of all the supernatural things going on, but we also want to treat the entire person. Remember, any religion that is truly worshiping Jesus Christ, who is truly God and truly man, must be a religion oriented toward that which is truly divine and truly human, that is spiritual and truly physical. And so we have, you know, exorcisms include both components. You've got to go get some medical treatment and just to make sure, and then you're going to have a specific assigned exorcist who's going to be operating under the authority and instruction of the bishop. You can at home say basic exorcism-like prayers, like the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. That's really good. That puts us into an area that we call spiritual warfare, which is an extension of the church's teaching on exorcism, but is not really the exact same thing. And so when it comes to that kind of stuff, let's move a little bit away from what exorcism is and that kind of thing, and into what most of us are going to actually be using in conjunction with it, which is the idea of I want to recognize the spiritual battle taking place. I know I have a guardian angel. I know that there are demons who are making it their business to see that I am tempted and that I lose my soul. Both of those are scriptural ideas. And so what do I do? How do I deal? Well, it turns out that the church has for a very long time been very, very interested in us seeing ourselves as warriors or soldiers for the Lord. We are, each and every one of us, by the nature of our having received the baptism, or the sacrament of baptism, the sacrament of confirmation, and the sacrament of Holy Communion, are fully members of the church. We are soldiers and warriors for the Lord, and we are specifically called upon with a mission to do what the Lord wants us to do. And we fight not with our strength, but we fight with His strength. We fight with His power. And the grace that the church gives us in the sacraments is far, far more powerful than we generally tend to be aware of. 
And so when we think about spiritual warfare, we are not talking about something that is just for a handful of people. We're talking about something that's a reality for all of us who are trying to live the Christian life. The basic notion is simply that we recognize the spiritual war taking place, and then we are docile. We wait for orders. We wait for instructions, to continue the military metaphor, and we say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, modern-day spiritual warfare, generally speaking, means exactly the same thing it means in the exorcism component, making a regular confession making a regular Holy Communion, only receiving communion in the state of grace. It means saying, you know, it means praying every day. It means doing penance. It means doing works of mercy. It means being obedient to the moral law. I mean, this is basic Christian living. And when we talk about spiritual warfare, we're generally talking about fighting those parts of ourselves and fighting temptations. Some of us are going to be called to be associated with specialized kinds of the spiritual life, with specialized aspects of the spiritual life. Some of us will call, be called to be mystics. We might witness Jesus appear to us. We might hear the voice of the saints or the angels speak to us. Some of us might be called to very specific kinds of, of redemptive suffering, for example, like St. Teresa of Lisieux. Some of us might be called to, to be involved in teams working with clergy to perform exorcisms or to work with those who are oppressed or who are obsessed. That may happen, but for the vast majority of us, we're not going to be in that boat. We're called to live the ordinary Christian life and to be docile to what the Lord wants of us. And for us, spiritual warfare is a, is a, a kind of a language that we can use to talk about how we fight off our own temptations, or rather our own bad impulses, and to fight off the temptations for others. Now it's become more uh, interesting to listen to, it's become more uh, popular uh, uh, in terms of spiritual writing in the last hundred years, in large part because Pope Pi oh, not Pius, Pope Leo XIII penned two different prayers to St. Michael the Archangel and then insisted that all masses, uh, all masses end with what he called the Leonine prayers, which were three Hail Marys, a Hail Holy Queen, the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, a little simple collect, and um, I've missed one in there. The three Hail Marys, and a Hail Holy Queen, the, uh, a simple collect, the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, um, and then the invocation of the most sacred heart of Jesus. And these are called the Leonine prayers. And so if you, you attend Mass with me at St. Edward, we say those prayers. If you attend uh, Latin Mass, usually they're said at the end of Latin Mass, and some more and more priests are kind of including them in their ordinary parish life. But St. Leo had a mystical experience and became very, very concerned for the state of the church. And so he penned, he wrote these prayers to St. Michael the Archangel um, that were very, very deliberately associated with the fact that the, the, the world is always at war and the end is coming nigh. Now that was 120 years ago. We don't know when the end will be, but we know that we're supposed to be living as if the end were right now. And so spiritual warfare is something that, that we have to be a little cautious with. We don't want to get into our heads the idea that everybody is in some kind of great spiritual battle and every one of us is called to be a warrior in the same way. Um, I, was, you know, I grew up in kind of charismatic communities and a lot of the charismatic folks want to think that you need to have spiritual warfare as a giant part of your spiritual life. That's not really accurate. But then you have some other folks, and I'm involved in more traditional communities now, traditional folks who would say that has nothing to do with what we do. At the end of the day, the last part of the Our Father is defend us from evil. You know, and so there is a genuine role for praying against my own temptations, praying against external temptations, recognizing the role of demons and angels and supernatural forces in the world in which we live that make spiritual warfare something we all have a part in, but doesn't mean that we all have the same part in. And that's where we want to be cautious. We don't want to become overzealous and then find ourselves you know, thinking, I need to be part of an exorcism team now. That's not really the best way to look at what we're doing. 
And so what does spiritual warfare look like? Like I said before, it means living the Christian life properly. Confession, communion, uh, the, the, the prayer, uh, penance, and works of mercy that every Christian life should have. And it involves perhaps adding a few specific prayers. St. Michael the Archangel. The rosary is arguably the best prayer that we have in terms of spiritual warfare. Um, Additionally, too, I think at the end here, because I want to uh, bring things to a close, because there's only so much to say about this um, in, in, a, in a setting that's as, as generic as this. When it comes right down to it, should we be concerned? Yes, Satan is real. Uh, his power is real. His smarts are real. His ability to deceive is very real. Remember, Satan deceived a large group of angels into falling from heaven with him. He is an incredibly brilliant deceiver. That's what his name means, the deceiver. At the same time, ought we to be nervous? Ought we to be freaked out? Ought we to fret? No, because Christ has won the victory. The Lord Jesus is the Lord Jesus. And so we know that he will defeat the enemy. It's not up to me to conquer the devil. It's not up to me as a priest to conquer the devil. It is up to me to listen to what the Lord wants from me. And if the Lord puts in my heart a strong devotion to St. Michael the Archangel, then by God, I need to act on it. And if the Lord tells me, look, you just need to live a Christian life, raise your kids and do that, then that's the direction I need to go. I don't need to get into my head an idea that because I have a morbid fascination with angels or demons or whatever, that I then have a vocation to be an exorcist. And that applies to lay people and priests alike. I know some very, very good people. I know a priest who recently left the priesthood because he got involved in, in uh, spiritual warfare ministry and he was not prepared for it. And he got involved into it. He got involved into it a little bit too enthusiastically. And he's the second priest I know who left the Catholic priesthood because of, of being too excited and too zealous about being involved in, in exorcism ministry when that's something the Lord clearly had not called him to do. And so all of us need to be aware that exorcisms are a real thing. All of us need to be aware that spiritual warfare is a real thing. All of us need to be aware that there are spiritual, supernatural forces all over the place, all around us. We need to be aware of that. But we don't need to become panicky about it because the Lord is the Lord. And if he wants you to be involved in that, he'll get you into it. If he wants you to be involved in, in direct care for the poor, he'll get you into that. If he wants you to be involved in simply leading a good, ordinary Christian life in your parish, that's what he'll, get, that's what he'll tell you to do as well. If we open our hearts, we listen to him, he will put us where we need to be. And so we do need to be concerned, but we don't need to fret. We don't need to worry. Exorcisms are very real. Demons are very real. Our guardian angels are very real. And so all we need to do is keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the leader and perfecter of our faith, as the book of Hebrews says, and leave the rest to the Lord to figure out. And so I hope you have an interesting, I hope you've had a, a little bit of an interesting wake-up call on exorcisms. If you do have any questions or, or more specific uh, concerns, please reach out on Facebook, social media, Twitter, uh, Instagram, whatever, wherever you find this post. Please feel free to read out, reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. God bless you and a very, very happy Triduum to you. For those who are watching from my parish or if you'd just like to watch me, our Triduum service services will be Holy Thursday at 5.30 p.m., Good Friday at 5.30 p.m., Holy Saturday at 8 p.m., and you can watch that on pretty much any place you're watching this video. I hope you have a great, great, great Triduum, and hopefully be able soon to say Happy Easter.